You're listening to a Reliance podcast, conversations and insights about our efforts to end sexual violence in one generation. There's pressure to get these kids guilty. Even if they're guilty, they'll blame that they didn't do this and that. I hope, you know, that the truth comes out. When I first read the story, there wasn't a lot of substance to the article. Two high school football players had been charged just a couple of paragraphs about these two boys and that was it. I thought this is nuts because that town is so entrenched in their football team. This is big news. So that's when I started snooping around. I had never seen a case constructed like this that many people who have some information. This was a sexual assault with teenagers, and the cell phones told the story. We had photos. We had 400,000 text messages. It was on Twitter, actually. Just the complete lack of empathy, that was what was so frightening. I mean, it was all out there. I just didn't understand it at all I, because I don't think it's something that doesn't occur in other cities and states and counties all over. If teachers knew about it, if coaches knew about it, if a principal knew about it, if parents knew about it, why was nothing done about that? And the question was, is this football town, you know, putting its daughters at risk by protecting its sons in a situation like this? Hello, my name is Brian Pinero, and I'm with Reliance, and I'm actually here with Nancy Storsman, who's the director for Roll Red Wolf, a great documentary that you're going to be hearing a lot more, uh, especially if you haven't seen it yet, but it's going to be, I believe, on PBS. Yep, it'll be on PBS June 17th. I think a lot of people know about the Steubenville rape in 2012, mm -hmm. but a lot of them don't really know about the documentary. Mm -hmm. So just really quickly, tell me a little bit about just the documentary and, and kind of what you did going back and looking at that incident. Yeah, so the documentary Roll Red Roll looks at the Steubenville, Ohio rape case, the first rape case in the U.S. to go viral. So it was this really interesting intersection of social media, kind of the rise of social media. Suddenly everyone's using it, but they don't quite know the power of it, especially teenagers. A rise in an understanding of rape culture because these young men in the story documented, tweeted, took photos. Not so much of the incident, but jokes and laughing about it and you know really stuff that could spread because it mm -hmm. wasn't criminal most of it but that sort of put in front of america just how graphic rape culture is and how accepted it was in this community the hacker group anonymous got involved right. and they right. really really made this thing go everywhere yeah. international it became a huge story and i went a year later to see if people were still grappling with it or mm -hmm. if they had moved on and like the whole town was completely affected right. by what happened and you know I've done anti-violence work and and I know that a rape is not just between two people it really ripples out and affects so many relationships relationships with you know victim or perpetrators families friends communities church school mm -hmm. like it's a network of relationships and there's a tear when that happens and and that town was just this microcosm of all these ripple effects. And then the more I stuck around and the more I dug in, we learned the prior rapes and the pattern of behavior. Right. And so there's kind of a thriller conspiracy element to the film. I remember watching it last year with my jaw open about like, how did I not pay more attention to this? And clearly it came out in 2018. Have you thought about like how this, uh, this film 
hitting at this time, just kind of the impact, is this exactly what you thought or is it even more now that it's come out in this time and everything that's kind of happened since 2017 and Me Too? I mean, what's amazing is how ready people are to have this conversation. And very specifically, I wanted to make a film about sexual violence that was not about the victim. Mm -hmm. So often the narrative, like, oh, it's a story about rape. Okay, so the victim's giving her testimony and she's crying on camera and then we're gonna, you know, really scrutinize her and decide whether or not we believe her and empathize and all of that part of my French bullshit, right? So initially the work was like on our shoulders to tell our stories, do this performance of public pain to get, you know, essentially men to care. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not interested in making a film like that. If we are going to change the culture, we have to look at the behavior. We have to look at the perpetrators. We have to look at the culture that enables rape because victims are on such a huge spectrum. It really makes no difference what a victim of sexual violence is doing or wearing or drinking or not drinking. So shifting the focus and making this film really about the boys and really about the town is new. And I wasn't sure if people were gonna get it or if I would have to like spell it out for them. And what's been incredible is that we had this Me Too crescendo mm -hmm. and we have language now. What's been really exciting is the reviews of the film. So the critical acclaim, which was pretty much majority of our reviews were written by male film critics. Mm -hmm. They were so ready for this movie. Right. Making references to the Kavanaugh hearings, making references to yeah. spring break and fraternities. I'm like, this is a film about high school football context. Right. And I love that you're pulling it as right. wide as it is. So I think there is more of an understanding, not just of the prevalence of rape, because like, duh, right? We know that. And that's the beginning of Me Too, scratching the surface for the most basic person who's going to deny rape mm -hmm. is a problem. So we're done denying it. And I think the film actually provides an opportunity to look at like, okay, well, what's the root cause? Like what's going on? Right. How have I enabled it as a parent, as a teacher, as a coach? Not because I'm terrible, but because, and I think what the film also shows is um, this is the culture we're all raised in. Right. So this, these aren't unusual children, right? These aren't unusual teenagers. This is a really toxic environment and right. that kind of environment is um, capable of producing sociopathic violent behavior. Even though that all this has happened, has the culture changed or are there still pieces in which people are still trying to maybe, are more afraid of maybe what they have participated in or what they have allowed? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really universal. So I think what's powerful about the film and where we all need to go into less of a call out culture and more right. of a call in. Right. Right, so everyone that sees the film, especially men, especially male athletes, any kind of guy is like, oh wow. Yeah. Just the language, what I've laughed at, what I've known about and yes. not done anything. We've all known about something and not done anything. We've all participated tacitly because this has been our culture. Our schools, our jokes, our pop culture, our television has enabled Right. us to be desensitized, right? To be like, rape is hilarious, prison rape, ha ha ha, don't drop the soap. We're all part of it. And there's a real fear and unwillingness to acknowledge that sometimes people you love can do really bad things. Mm -hmm. That that guy that was your study partner, who was always really nice to you, may have done this thing to someone else. Like, it's really hard for us to hold any kind of nuance, you know? And we we say, because of also our criminal justice system, like, oh, well, rape, lock him up and throw away the key, but not if it's my friend. Mm -hmm. And then actually, if it's my friend, maybe can we call it something else? Right. I also think, and, I, and you were talking earlier about the, you gotta get away from the call out and call in. Mm -hmm. I think your film does a really good job, too, of like, you're not saying, hey, sports is bad. This is what happens. So I love sports, I understand competitive athleticism, all that stuff. But what we wanted to do with this film is put it in the storytelling language and pace of teen boys of football, have that energy, have that music, have that true crime component. So you're sort of like, what's happening next? What's happening next? To keep you in your seat so that 
men would be engaged. It is completely available for sports groups to take and run yes. with. We would love any help and support sort of unlocking the door to open up some willingness with the NFL, with the NCAA, with the NHL, all of whom I've had conversations with about using this film. So we, we're really looking at how do we utilize prevention mm -hmm. and utilize sports because I mean, yeah. really a lot of the values, a lot of the things that are taught in sports, the discipline, we even hear that from the police officers saying like, you need to man up, mm -hmm. you need to discipline, you need to step up. It really needs to be modeled also by coaches. So it's not fair to put all this pressure on 16 That's year olds. Right. So the adults from the top need to be modeling. This is what is acceptable on my field and off the field. Mm -hmm. They just need a one sheet. They need one piece of paper that says it's a definition of break. You have to get permission. Absolutely. This is a definition of consent. Mm -hmm. If I hear anything, any any of this going on, you are kicked off the team. Right. Right. Boom. That would change things. That would make every other bystanding player say, yo, you're the quarterback. We need you on Friday. That girl is drunk. I'm taking you home. Because kids, kids will fall in line they if they are being held accountable and they all worship the coach. It's not just on the kids and mm -hmm. it's not just on the coaches. And one of the things that I think there's one part where the superintendent talks about, like, well, we followed our procedure. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we always talk to when we're talking to coaches groups, when we talk to uh, athletic directors and stuff, is that if you guys don't set these expectations, mm -hmm. it's not going to trickle down. But more than that, what's your response? Because it's going to happen. Did you ever know mm -hmm. if there was a procedure or was there anything well, talked about or did an adult say, like, hey, this is kind of what we would have done in that situation or yeah i mean i think when the superintendent he he calls it their protocol right protocol was followed i never saw that in writing but i believe what the protocol is if there's trouble on the team it's left to the coach to investigate it mm -hmm. which is bordering on a title nine violation you know the other thing that i noticed in student bills you have protocol right and we know that the u.s military has protocol we know that corporations have protocol right. You know, it's a great word. It means like we made rules and laws. And like, I think yeah, now we're in this moment of reckoning of actually taking a look at who writes the protocol. You know, when I spent a lot of time in Steubenville, um, I noticed that there were no women in leadership really anywhere. So if you look down at the football field, beautiful arena, tons of coaches, assistant coaches, volunteer coaches. I mean, there's 70 or 80 boys, right? And then a ton of staff. It's a program. Yeah, it's a program, right? And there's no equivalent for girls because there is no women's football. Then you go to city council meeting where they're making decisions about the town, right? And this was talked about in city council all the time. There are no women in city council positions. Then you go to church and you want to hear what are people talking about? They're obviously talking about this and it's the Catholic church. And there are no women standing at the pulpit ever. Mm -hmm. And then you have a superintendent. You know, the replacement superintendent was a woman, but at the time it was Mike McVeigh. So literally the entire town is run by men. Not to say that women are inherently feminist or women are going to do it better, but that is just a, like, a horrendous lack of representation. This film, I think, really just shows is that this is, this is not just a simple, we just got to talk to people. We just need to step up and say that we're never going to let this happen. This is ongoing work. So when you really think about that, did you think about that the legs that this film could have beyond just the awareness, beyond just kind of opening it up to, about, about thinking how it could be used in ways like that? I mean, we've shown this in various high schools in the Bronx. We were in Cleveland and a lot of like coaches were there. And we did some work with our coaching boys into men. When I was in mm -hmm. California, just a few screenings and talk backs, but I haven't been able to like sit in on a screening with a bunch of coaches. I would love, mm. I would love that opportunity. We would love this film to have that kind of legs. And I chose my scenes really carefully. We had hours and hours of footage to choose from and, you know, yelling at a kid who's 17 and saying, man up. I know you're, you're a football player. I know coach taught you better. And then we've just seen coach in another scene, basically like, can we redefine rape? Like unclear on what right. the definition is. And, you know, Sean and his buddy Gino saying, you know, football teaches you discipline and courage right. and all this great all stuff. Want, yeah. Can it go further? I'm sitting here wondering, did you walk away from the film being hopeful? Did you lose a little bit of hope in regards to thinking about athletics and thinking about just coaches and, or what, what, what did you come away from? 
Well, I knew that the film didn't end just when I finished it. Right. Like, uh -huh. we've crafted a study guide that can be broken right. out, and I think it's so well done. I worked on it with Joe Samalin, who used to be at Men Can Stop Rape, mm -hmm. and he does trainings with the New York City Parks Department, and he's just like, I love him. And I said, how am I going to deal with being with this film for another year or two? Like, what is going to bring me hope? And that's when we decided making sure that this campaign invites men to join us. They can be athletes, they can be clergy, they can be speakers, and we've had amazing people. Wade Davis, former NFL player, openly gay, incredible. I want to be around passionate men who are working alongside us to prevent gender-based violence. That gives me hope. You know, the women in my film give me hope. A blogger, Alex mm -hmm. Goddard, uh, Rachel yes. Sell. Marianne was the lead attorney. Mm -hmm. She loved the film. So these are the women who made this shit happen. But in terms of hope, for me, it's about the critical reviews from all these men who are like, we are so done with this culture. Yeah. Not and not and none of the reviews are an indictment of football. It's much larger. It's like we all participate. So the more allies we can bring in, the more hopeful I think it is. So yeah. June seventeenth, twenty nine. Do we have a time yet on PBS when it's going to be here? And this is national. Yes, it's going to be national. It's national. We are kicking off, no pun intended, the POV season. So we're mm -hmm. the season opener. So that's June seventeenth, either nine p.m. or ten p.m. nationally. It'll be streaming online, and then it will be available on a very big, well-known platform that everybody has. It's not public yet, um, and I don't know when the date of that acquisition. You know when you'll be able to you get totally, it there. Totally. What? You can totally see it right now. <laughs> right, um, yeah, <laughs> and you know, um, the great thing about working with PBS is that they make the film available yeah. to schools and libraries and stuff like that. So if you want the film, we have an educational distributor or you can do it through PBS. I'm also available to travel. I've been traveling on the road nonstop. I go to school, I've universities, heard. and I love to do events. So we can pull together a really compelling panel of incredible advocates and athletes to have this conversation. Well, again, I'm really excited, A, for you to be here. I'm, I'm really thankful for the work that you've done and putting this together. Like I said, it really, for me, made me really think back to it and really take an appreciation, I think, of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the conversations that are being had now and the openness to the conversations mm -hmm. is huge. And I, and I think your film is another piece and I think especially when we're going to see it in June, when it's going to be more public and everybody can see it, I'm really excited about the results it's going to have within athletics and really being a prevention tool. So thank you so much for being right. here. And again, you're you know, welcome. congratulations to your success and thank continue. You. Thank you. Thanks thank you so, so much. much.